Hello and welcome to Novelty. I'm Levon Baronyan and tonight we delve into a situation that strikes at the heart of Armenia's current struggles and future survival. The nation watches with anticipation as protests demanding Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan's resignation unfold, with particular concern centered on his approach to the Tavush region. Tavush, a critical border province with deep historical and cultural roots, now finds itself at the forefront of national concern. Pashinyan's capitulatory policies, which aim to, quote, seat lands for peace, end quote, put Tavush's security and Armenia's territorial integrity further at risk. The region faces an existential threat as a result of Pashinyan's willingness to compromise on Armenia's national interests in his supposed pursuit of an elusive peace. Leading the movement against Pashinyan is Archbishop Bagrat Galistanyan, primate of the Diocese of Tavush. His leadership of the, quote, Tavush for the homeland, end quote, movement began in the village of Kirans on May 4, reaching Yerevan only yesterday. The basis of the movement is opposition to the border demarcation process between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which begins with more concessions in Tavush. Tens of thousands from different regions of Armenia and the diaspora gathered in Republic Square in central Yerevan to welcome the marchers. The movement is about far more than just a single region or isolated incident. It is emblematic of a broader struggle for Armenia's integrity and the safeguarding of its borders. The Archbishop and the movement recognize the importance of unity across the nation, including support from the Armenian diaspora in order to command these dangers effectively. The participation of the people of Artsakh in the Tavush movement is a sign of unity and shared resolve. Many of these individuals have already experienced the loss of their homeland and do not want to see the same fate befall Tavush. Artsakh citizens echoed their strong desire to prevent further losses and protect the sovereignty of their nation. Drawing parallels with the historic leadership of Kharimian Hayrik, Archbishop Bagrat's role in these ev events reflect the enduring strength and influence of the Armenian clergy in guiding the nation through times of crisis. Kharimian Hayrik, the esteemed 19th century Katoikos of all Armenians, was known for his unwavering leadership and commitment to his people in the face of adversity. Pashinyan's approach to Tavush threatens to push Armenia closer to further territorial losses, leading to the erosion of the nation's sovereignty and the possible disruption of its cultural and historical ties to the land. This misguided pursuit of peace through concessions could lead to irreversible consequences for the Armenian people. The protests demand that Pashinyan step down, giving way to new leadership that will prioritize the protection of Armenia's borders and the preservation of its national interests. His immediate resignation is the only honorable course of action to prevent further damage to Tavush and the entire country. Tonight, I'm honored to have with me a special guest, Sarkis Zelveyan, a Christian activist and organizer in Los Angeles, who's been involved in organizing protests against Pashinyan's treacherous policies for several, several years. For decades, Sarkis has been on the front lines of the struggle for justice and national integrity, advocating for the protection of Armenia's sovereignty and territorial rights. In to the, tonight's episode, we will explore the implications of Pashinyan's leadership for Tavush and Armenia as a whole, along with the urgent call for change led by Archbishop Galistanyan and the dedicated citizens and activists standing up for their homeland. Let's begin this journey with a shared commitment to protecting the national heritage and securing a safe, just, and prosperous future for all Armenians in Armenia, the homeland. So again, Sarkis, thank you for being here today with me. Thank you for having me. Sarkis, you've been uh, a longtime activist in the community, um, involved in the Armenian church, several, several organizations. And for the last few years, you've been helping organize and uh, participating in protests against Pal Pashinyan's policies, uh, initially against uh, the capitulation in Artsakh, uh, and then later on, as we saw in the Berzor, you know, handoff, and now Tavush. Uh, how would you describe the sentiment among the Armenian diaspora in Los Angeles regarding Pashinyan's handling of Artsakh and now Tavush? The sentiment um, in the diaspora, at least in the, in, in the United States or in uh, Los Angeles, I can speak for, um, is um, of uh, uh, disappointment um, because uh, a lot of people did actually have hopes with this uh, velvet uh, um, show they had going on. 
Um, and now they got a dose of reality. And, and, and they, they got a dose of, a double dose of reality, actually, at this point. First dose was uh, um, the capitulation of Artsakh. Mm -hmm. Now we're going for a complete capitulation of Armenia from what it looks like. Um, so now they are waking up. I mean, um, Levon, let's face it, I mean, these are cognitive people. These are human beings. They have, you know, uh, uh, brains and which functions, for the most part at least. And uh, eventually they do come to their senses. I mean, they do see what's happening. They do see what's happening in uh, uh, Davush, where um, uh, people who were only a couple of months ago, uh, you know, uh, greeting uh, Pashinyan with open arms and, you know, uh, um, you know, sacrificing animals for him and what have you. Now they're sitting there pretty much crying hopeless. I mean, people like Bakrat Sirpazan said, you know, these are people who fought like lions in the mountains to protect their families, their homes, their uh, country. Now um, people in diaspora see all of this. Uh, they realize that, you know, what happened? What happened from a, from a man that's a lion will not uh, uh, take a step back and will protect at the cost of his life, his family, his home. Now he's sitting there hopelessly and crying, not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. Even if he wants to get up there and fight, he can't because he, his hands are tied behind him by the same Pashinyan regime. Mm -hmm. um, the diaspora also realizes that, wait a minute, uh, none of this could be a coincidence where Erdogan, Pashinyan, and Aliyev statements are all pretty much in cahoots. You know, uh, you hear the same statement from um, uh, Ankara, you hear the same from Baku, and if there's a little bit of doubt, Pashinyan jumps in and mm -hmm. makes sure he concurs everything that was said. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it is. Diaspora is finally waking up, just like people are waking up in Armenia. Let's face it, two months ago, you know, several attempts have been uh, done. Mm -hmm. You and I both know most of us have been involved in, mm -hmm. uh, in those uh, 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 um, protests, protests within Armenia and, or in, in uh, well, Yeah, within Armenia or, or we've been in communication. But what we've seen the last couple of days, uh, this is um, evidence that people are waking up. Um, you know what it is, Levon? Uh, you can act dead as much as you want, but if I pick up a stick and start poking you, eventually, you know, you're going to push that stick away, get, you're going to get up and probably push me away. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening. With all this, it, I mean, this was all a shock to us. Mm -hmm. It was a shock to you and I and people like us who are informed, who, who know what's going on, we're involved day to day. Imagine what it was, your ordinary Armenian, you know, that goes to home, comes, you know, goes to work, comes home, watches an hour of Armenian TV, you know, some show. Or whatever. doesn't watch Armenian. Or doesn't watch Armenian. Gets their news on uh, about Armenia on CNN. Right. Gets their news on, uh, on CNN. And, um, you know, this is a guy that's been so proud all his life. You know, we won. You know, b b we liberated Artsakh. This is, you know, the Armenian power. This is the Armenian will and courage. And all of a sudden, you know, we're this broken nation that we can't even protect our own borders. You know, people just everybody is walking all over us. Mm -hmm. uh, this was all a shock. I mean, in a way, I don't blame. You know me. I, I, I'm very direct and I'm very uh, um, straightforward. And I do express my opinions about the community and what have you. And I do blame sometimes the community. But at the same time, when I take a step back and realize... Wait a minute, man. You can't really blame these people because this is not something we're used to. As Armenians, we're mm -hmm. not, at least our generation Armenians, we're not used to this uh, capitulations. We're not used to this uh, embarrassments. We're not used to having our heads down. We're not used to defeat. Uh, we're not used to uh, losses. You know, it's our, it's it's in our... Well, at least not in the last 30 years, right? The, the, that's the, why the I said our generation. Exactly. The independence of Armenia and the liberation of Artsakh for our generation was a defining moment right. in, in creating uh, our impressions about our homeland. And uh, as we talked about, we've talked about in the past, 
uh, you know, the independence of Armenia also brought about a new sense of unity in, in common causes, right? During the Soviet Union, there were divisions. There were obviously uh, differences in approach to Soviet Armenia based on, you know, which political party or which church uh, someone associated with. But in the last 25 years prior to, you know, the so-called Velvet Re Revolution in 2018, irrespective of whether you were a member of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation or a Hunchagyan or a Ramkavar or a member of the AGBU or whether you uh, were the Ejmiyazdakan church or the Kirikyan, it doesn't matter. There were two things, as we talked about, that were common to all of us, that, that was a common agenda, and that was the in, in, international recognition of the Armenian genocide in pursuit of justice and the Artsakh, uh, you know, the liberation of Artsakh to secure it with a de jure status, right? right? So either join Armenia or become independent. Those uh, realities, those agendas were shared by everybody in the diaspora and are, are still are. So now I think the diaspora, and I think you would agree with this, is starting to realize that the government in Armenia, the government in Yerevan, after they've taken their masks off, doesn't really share in that agenda, right? And I think that's starting to cause this awakening. I wouldn't call it a government, just a group of people I would say, um, because um, government sounds, you know, they're governing things. Mm. In this case, they're not governing things. Mm. They're just running a show. Uh, so they're just in those seats, but you say that they're not, they're, it's, uh, there's no acting government in Romania. Uh, there's no real government. Uh, uh, right. Lemonjan, when you have a person that the very first job this person has, uh, um, Ruben Rubinian, for instance, mm -hmm. the very first, at very first time he put on a suit and a tie and he went to work as a um, deputy minister. foreign minister. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the, the, how do you call a group of someone people? Someone who spent several years in Turkey. Someone, uh, I'm not even, I'm not even getting there. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's, that's a whole complete, you know, topic Educated of conversation. Educated and trained in Turkey. Right. Is, is and he's not the only one. part of the, the foreign ministry in Armenia. And he's not the only one. Sakis, um, you know, the Armenian diaspora plays a crucial role in, in lending support for these types of movements. Uh, six years ago, we saw that some in the diaspora, you know, notoriously Serge Tankians or Arsene Khanjians and whatnot, but also here in Glendale, certain figures that later on ended up, uh, you know, moving to Armenia. I don't want to name him, but you know who, we're, who I'm talking about. He was the former mayor of Glendale. They, they, their participation in the so-called Velvet Revolution uh, played a role because the people in Armenia, in, in many cases, look to the diaspora, right? They kind of look up to the diaspora. Um, you know, and, and many in the diaspora are now actively participating in raising uh, awareness uh, uh, here. But what would you say, in, in, at least in this latest iteration of protests, right? What do you see the role of us in the diaspora? What, what should we be doing, according to you, according to your beliefs, to support this movement of, you know, and that's going on in Armenia, led by Archbishop uh, Bagrat uh, Galistanian? Um, just like the Archbishop said, well, we got to raise uh, awareness. We got to uh, raise our voice. We got to let, uh, um, first and foremost, wake up our community, which looks like they're waking up. And uh, we got to take this... Uh, uh, to the international community, if mm -hmm. uh, there is a such thing, which uh, um, I personally don't don't believe, because I, I I think unless you care for yourself, no one no one else will. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, the current situation we're in, um, I and I say this with a lot of pain in my heart, um, we're laugh laughing stock in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, decisions are being made about and for Armenia without representation from Armenia. I mean, how much more degraded can you be as a, um, I won't say as a nation, but as a country or, or as well, a government? without real representation from Armenia. Because we often see, too, that, you know, when, even when we're talking to American um, high-level government officials, whether in the State Department, whether in Congress or Senate, right, it's hard to ask the United States to take a certain line on policy when it comes to Armenia, when the government of Armenia is pushing a different line. Right. 
For instance, how many years, how many years um, diaspora uh, organizations, let it be ANCA, let it be the uh, assembly, they've spent millions of dollars, ran from this door to that door, this state to that state, you know, pushing the recognition of Artsakh and everything else, right? All to be thrown away by one single... Exactly. In All one, of a sudden... A couple of years, government one says, I trader recognize gets it as up, part of One trader gets up and makes one statement, Artsakh is a part of Azerbaijan. What happened? Mm -hmm. Everything is down the drain. Well, he argues so, that that's a path to peace. You know, we have to... So? Well, I'm playing devil's advocate here. He says we have to reconcile with our neighbors... We have to, you know, we have to kind of seed lands to have peace. If we want to have peace, that's the price that we have to pay. Um, you know, how, how do we argue against that? I, I know that there are arguments toward, against that, but what would you argue to the everyday Armenian who says, you know, we're tired of war? Yeah, maybe we do have to give up certain things. One, one thing he's forgetting that our neighbors are not France, Italy, Switzerland, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we are quote-unquote, blessed with neighbors that are pretty much animals mm. that can walk into a house and behead a helpless grandma, that can walk into a house and cut open a pregnant lady's uh, stomach and take the baby out and kill it. I mean, our region has been... Um, the center of all geopolitical conflicts for the past, for as long as we can remember. I find it very, very, very difficult because we ought to face it. The conflict in our region is not for us and it's not because of us. We're just a victim of big geopolitical games that happen to take place in our region over and over and over and over, at least once every century. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, I as got, uh, uh, Sarkis, I know that you're the son of a priest, right? Um, your your father, you know, God rest his soul, for many years was an active uh, member of clergy in in the Western United States, um, and you as the son of a priest, and your father was also very much active in the community. How do you respond to critics uh, who argue today that the church should stay away from politics and just focus solely on, on spiritual matters? You know, that all of a sudden, you know, especially obviously from Pashinyan's camp, um, they're criticizing Archbishop Bagrat uh, Galastan, and in some cases not even referring to him as Serpaza and ultimately disrespecting him. How would you respond to that criticism that the church should stay away? This is a political matter, and the church should not, and clergy should not involve themselves in politics. Um, to answer that, we need to reflect back on history. Uh, Battle of Avarite. Church was out of it until it came to a point where the, uh, as we say in Armenian, you know, the, the knife got to the bone. Sardarabat. Church was not involved in any way politically until the political leaders went to Echmiadzin and asked uh, um, uh, His Holiness uh, Gevork V uh, Surenyan to move to Sevan, to uh, uh, retreat to Sevan, where he said, no, I will pick up my sword and I will die at the steps of Echmiadzin and I will not move out of here. That's when the whole Sardarabad movement uh, snowballed into effect. Or even just same, 20 years before that with Kharimian Hayrik. Kharimian Hayrik. Same is today. Um, for the past 30 years of Armenia's independence, we've, we haven't seen the church getting involved in politics. Mm -hmm. Not internal politics, not external politics. They've been doing what they've been doing. But at the same time, we got to understand the uniqueness of the Armenian Apostolic Church that it's not just solely a Christian entity. Um, it's a national church. As mm -hmm. we say, Azgai mm Niegeretsi. -hmm. So uh, the Armenian church and Armenian nation have been intertwined um, uh, by blood for the past 1700 years. Because every time the Armenian nation bled, the Armenian church bled twice with it every time 
the church bled, the people were there to help the church to stop that bleeding. So, uh, and as our, part of our, on the flip side of that too, as part of uh, you know civilian Armenians. Part of what we've always defended was our church as well, right? That's the key part of the Armenian identity. I mean, when you look at when you look at self determination, when you look at the, the striving for independence to be able to rule yourself, that's intrinsically tied to even defending our ability to worship God in, in the way that we want to worship God, right? So, in that sense, you're right. It is intrinsically tied to an Armenian identity. Uh, and the Armenian also, Lemon. Um, what gives you or what gives us our identity or what gives a nation or a people their identity? Mm -hmm. their well, I mean, uh, there, there's obviously different things that make up Armenian identity according to different uh, interpretations, but it starts with your language. Language. Uh, your culture, your shared culture. culture. Right. Um, all these things, again, the uniqueness of the Armenian church versus any other church, all these things that give us our identity as a nation as Armenians, has been given to us by the church. Mm. Good point. Because even the See, language aspect of it, everything right, was preserved through the church until language, only a few art, years ago. culture, music, um, and I'm not mentioning religion because we're talking why, well, how is it different? Religion is always there, obviously. But in addition to all of that, what makes a nation a nation or a people? you know, a, a, a unique people of their own, is their culture, language, you know, their um, uh, ability to traditions. communicate, traditions, you know, their alphabet and what have you. All of these things that gives uh, you your identity has been given us uh, by our church. In the Armenian context, yeah. Because us, even, in the Armenian it, context. Until a few hundred years ago. You can't even... say the same for the Roman Catholic Church. You can't say the same for the Anglican Church. You can't say the same for any other church. But the Armenian church, the uniqueness is what makes us Armenian truly has been given to us by the church. Had it not been by the church, you and I would not be sitting over here, you know, in the United States uh, speaking about Armenia, Armenian politics, or the current Armenian situation. That's the difference. Um, uh, I'm sure, uh, like Bagrat Sirpazan uh, keeps saying time after time, Clergymen are not dying to get into politics. They're, it's not very desirable um, to get into politics. I mean, Let's it, face it, what, what person in the right, in the right uh, uh, mind would want to get into politics well. anyways? <laughs> That's why I said what person. <laughs> but so what I'm saying is, it's not like they want to get you know, involved in the... But, uh, they're not getting involved in politics. They're doing their uh, unique duty as the Armenian church are preserving this nation, preserving Armenia and Armenians. And, and as an institution. They're stepping, as an institution. And, and they're to stepping extent, into their historical the, the, plate to do again what they have done for centuries upon centuries. So see, we, 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 when we talk about Armenian institutions, at least in the last 30 years, uh, we talk, obviously, the Armenian Church, which is a 2,000-year-old institution. Uh, but we have the Armenian Armed Forces as an institution. Uh, we also have, let's say, our classical Armenian parties and whatnot as institutions. Um, and a few others. And we unfortunately saw that in the last five, six years, this regime in Armenia went after each of those institutions one by one. Uh, and tried to dismantle it, and, and in many ways succeeded, unfortunately, with the Armenian Armed Forces, because ultimately the Armenian Armed Forces isn't an independent institution. It's beholden to the Armenian government. Here, at least, there's a resilience, right, because the Armenian Church is independent of the government, and so it can react and it can defend itself against these attacks, uh, and, and rightfully so. Um, so one of the things that... Uh, Archbishop Bagrat, uh, Sarpazan Bagrat, made in his demands, which was only after coming to Yerevan, was the resignation, he demanded the resignation of uh, Nikol Pashinyan as prime minister. Pashinyan quickly refused, uh, unsurprisingly. But correction, Bagrat Sarpazan did not demand his resignation. People demanded his resignation. And Bagrat Sarpazan, he just conveyed a message. Yes. Uh, so... 
Because there's there, a difference. I'm sorry. There is. One bishop demanding or 100 and I think they were saying officially 130,000-ish people. Mm -hmm. So there is a big difference. 130,000 people demanding his resignation plus Bagrat Sirpazan or Bagrat... Point taken. He was, yeah. He, he, because, yes, this, this movement, this safe or Davush, you know, the Davush movement, originally when it started, it was really just about the delimitation and demarcation happening in Davush, right? It was only because the people there saw that the government is completely neglecting the rights of the people there, neglecting the rights of their safety, that this kind of escalated. Um, so Pashinyan quickly responded that he's not going to uh, resign, that he is the legitimately elected uh, prime minister of Armenia. Um, and, and that's why he's not going to resign. What would you respond to that? I mean, uh, Serpazan well, Bagrat made a good point in the last day about that. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming you've you heard his response to that. But um, what would you respond to Pashinyan's claims that he's the legitimately elected prime minister and he's not going to resign based on some demands from, you know, 100,000 people? This is the same Pashinyan that was saying... When there is 100,000 people in the Republic Square, I will resign, right? Well, they said a lot this of things. This is the same Pashinyan that said, if I uh, give one millimeter of land of Armenia to Azerbaijan, I will cut my hands off, right? It's the same Pashinyan that said, Artsakh is Armenia. Same Pashinyan that got up and said, Artsakh and, is Armenia. Uh, you know, period. And then two years later, he got up and said, Artsakh has never been Armenia. Mm-hmm. So, well, 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 he claims he's a legitimate prime minister. So what's the response to that? Well, I guess life will show. A um, couple of more days, a few more days, I think, if we wait, we'll find out mm -hmm. how legitimate Pashinyan is or was. Um, uh, One of the things that was an interesting uh, way of uh, describing it, uh, that Bishop... Archbishop uh, Bagrat Kalstanyan uh, responded to, he said, legitimacy isn't granted just by an electoral process. The legitimacy is granted to you when you fulfill promises that you've made during your elections, right? So if you came and you lied about what you're going to do and you got elected and today you're doing the complete opposite, just because the electoral process yep. itself was quote unquote legitimate does not give you legitimacy. Which is why I said same Pashinyan that said Artsakh is Armenia, same Pashinyan that said many things. So basically his whole campaign, his whole election, his whole everything. Again, I'll go back to uh, Baghdad Sirpazan. Everything about Pashinyan and his regime and the past six years of the Armenian reality has been uh, a, a, a lie, has been a bubble, has been a balloon filled with uh, empty air. And uh, that's what's being exposed now. Um, uh, perhaps, and I, I, again, I doubt in reality 600 and what was it, 80,000 people or what have you elected for him. Uh, let's Even be, then, that was only... Uh, let's be a devil's advocate and say they didn't use any you know, resources, there was no fraud. Truly 680 people went to the group yeah. or 1,000 people voted for him. Again, like Bagrat Sirpazan said, and like I said right now, everything was based on a lie. Just like you need some plumbing work done in your house, I come, I tell you I'm a plumber, I'm gonna fix your plumbing, you pay me, you come back a month later, you realize your roof is gone, your walls are gone, you don't have a bedroom anymore. And you have stuff floating on the floors. And, and you have stuff floating on the floors. Yeah. So another uh, point on that is that um, ultimately we've never seen in Armenia, uh, Armenia, this is not just a modern Armenia, in the history of Armenia, we can make this a statement, we've never seen a transfer of power in government via elections. Very few people kind of reflect on that. In Armenia, we've never had a transfer, we've never seen a transfer of power to an opposing government or an opposing party or whatever via elections, right? Because obviously prior to 1918, we never had an Armenian statehood, uh, independent Armenian, let's say, republic. We had kingdoms, right? right? And a kingdom, obviously, we're not talking about democracy. 
Uh, so in 1918, you know, we know that the first Armenian statehood was established. There was the Armenian Revolutionary Federation that was in, in uh, power. And then as the Soviet army advanced and took over Armenia, it was the Sovietization of Armenia. There was no elections that changed power between uh, you know, the ARF leadership and, and the communist leadership. Yeah. Then the Soviet Union collapsed. Same roughly thing. around 1990. Levon Terpetrosian was already the leader of the Supreme Soviet in Armenia, right? So he ran the elections. He officiated. He was in power when he ran the elections when he first got elected. Uh, and then got re-elected under his own, uh, you know, he was again in power. Then there were pro there were protests. There was pressure put on him by Vazgen Sarksen at the time, Karnadem, Mirjan Kocharian, Ser Sarksen. He resigned. He resigned. And Robert Kocharian, who was the acting, who actually was the prime minister, became acting president, and then officiated elections. He did his own elections. He did his own elections, and then one might argue that the leadership presidency of Serge Sarkisian was a continuation of that. And then Serge Sarkisian, President Sarkisian, resigned under pressure and handed power over to Pashin, uh, to Pashin and through the parliamentary. So. You know, his claim of legitimacy is also challenged. I would challenge it from that aspect, right? Because in Armenia, you've never had an election like we have in the United States where a Democrat president, or in this recent case, a Republican president, right, gets replaced by a Democratic Party president through elections. Uh, so that, that would be interesting to see, too. Both times that Pashinyan resigned, right, to trigger elections, he stayed on as um, acting prime minister, which is something that even uh, President or Prime Minister Ser Sarkisian, who was accused of, you know, all these things, didn't do, right? He resigned. He stepped away. Right. He didn't officiate new elections. Right. So that's also another thing that, you know, to challenge P Pashinyan's uh, legitimacy. Uh, one last thing, Sarkis. You have children. I have children. What would, what would your message be to the youth today in the diaspora on how they can get involved in, in all this? What should they be doing? You know, every time I get asked this question, um, God rest his soul, I remember uh, Gurgen Yanikian's statement. And the best statement or best uh, message I can give to the, to the youth, to the next generation, is uh, go to YouTube, look up Gurgen Yanikian, and listen to what he has to say to you. Interesting advice. Sarkis, thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your insights and experiences. Um, the challenges facing Armenia and its people are immense. Uh, but hearing your thoughts and perspectives gives us hope that change is possible through collective action and a commitment to protection, protecting our nation's future. As we've discussed, the situation in Tavush and across Armenia requires vigilance, resilience, and unity. The dedication shown by Archbishop Bagrat Galistanian and the citizens who have gathered to protest is a testament to the enduring spirit of the Armenian people. It reflects a legacy of standing up for justice, sovereignty, and the right to self-determination. As we conclude tonight's episode, I want to express gratitude to our audience for joining us on this journey and to the Alpha News Channel for this platform. Let us take inspiration from the example of Khrimian Hayrik and the unwavering leadership of the Armenian Church. Let everyone stand firm against the erosion of Armenia's sovereignty and work towards a future where their lands, culture, and history are protected. Together, we must continue to fight for the integrity of Armenia and for leaders who truly represent the will of its people. Let's support movements like Tavush for the Homeland and keep advocating for Armenia's rights on every front. Until our next episode, stay curious, stay informed, and continue to engage with the ever-evolving landscape of ideas and innovation. This has been Novelty with Levon Baronian. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.